Welcome all to Issues with Noah Rothman on Two Way. I'm your host, Noah Rothman. And today we're going to begin with the Biden administration's very deep suspicion of you and your consumer preferences. The Biden administration has embarked on a crusade. I don't know a better word for it. It is ideological. It has eschatological overtones. It is a crusade to rid the American economy of a combustion-powered vehicles, or at least to phase them out by the early parts of the next decade. It is pursuing this goal by drafting the EPA into imposing new rules uh, that will uh, make car makers, force car makers to meet targets in which EVs will account for roughly 56% of new car sales by 2023. It's hoped that by then, fewer than three in 10 cars will be fueled entirely by gasoline. The only problem is that electric vehicles now account for just about seven or 8% of the car market. And automakers fret that the market could truncate even further if consumer enthusiasm for EVs declines apace. So we're confronted with a familiar problem. The technocrats insist that they're merely going after the dirty combustion engines, but they swiftly encounter the real obstacle before their reforms. It's not the markets. It's not greedy industrialists. It's not the capitalist enterprise itself. It's you and your damnable preferences. We're not just talking about electric vehicles. In so many other sectors of the economy, a meddlesome sort has committed itself to waging war on consumer choice, Ch choices at least that don't comport with the paradigm preferred by progressive social engineers. The Biden administration has uh, folded amid a backlash against its proposed effort by the Consumer Safety Protection Commission that would have limited the sale of new natural gas-powered appliances, but Democrat-led states and municipalities across the countries are moving forward by imposing uh, gas hookup bans and new residential construction. The design is a backdoor effort to get rid of your gas-powered appliances. We're not just talking about stoves and ranges either. Water heaters, furnaces, dryers, all the stuff that natural gas powers. It's on the chopping block and set to be replaced with pricier and higher maintenance alternatives. Last year, the EPA proposed a rule prohibiting hydrofluorocarbons in ACs and refrigeration systems designed to increase the cost of refrigerants, an effort was that was surreptitiously aimed at equalizing the cost of, uh, or uh, rather increasing the cost of traditional air conditioners. And the administration's preferred pr uh, replacement, these hybridized heat pumps, are again more expensive and usually involve more maintenance. The word efficiency is bandied about a lot in these efforts to get rid of the appliances that you like and work and replace them with something else. But efficiency has become a euphemism for something else. It no longer means getting a job done quickly and easily and well. It means the amount of inputs that go into something. Less is more efficient. More is not. Uh, if you look at dark blue municipalities around the country, it's not just appliances in your home, but the appliances outside your home that municipal officials are waging war on, most notably the old reliable two-stroke gasoline-powered engine. The rationale that advocates use in their effort to anathematize gas-powered leaf blowers, string trimmers, and lawnmowers are myriad. They're dirty. Sometimes they're even racist. They're loud. They're intrusive, etc. But the electric alternatives, which work just fine until you have to replace the lithium ion battery, are great for small jobs, not for big ones. If you happen to have an acre or more of land, you're going to find that the electric alternative just doesn't do the job you want. But you're not allowed to make that choice anymore if you live in certain parts of the country. From the incandescent bulb to my favorite hobby horse, the ubiquitous disposable plastic bag, you're being deprived of your access to products for your own sake. The technocrats know what's best for you, even if you have to be saved from yourself. To help me navigate this ideological thicket and explore some other topics today, I'm thrilled to be joined by two people I greatly admire, Washington Post columnist Megan McArdle and her colleague, Washington Post columnist Jason Willock. Hi, guys. Hi. Thank Good you both so much for joining me. It's Washington Post Day. I really appreciate it. It's always Megan. Washington Post Day, Noah. It's, it's always Washington Post in my heart. <laughs> Megan, I want to start with you. So forgive the introduction. It sprawled a little bit, but I want to start with EVs and your piece that you wrote for the Washington Post uh, on this issue, a very good piece entitled, The Best Way to Get Everyone Into Electronic Cars? Question mark. Hint, it's not a mandate. As the headline suggests, you're not just skeptical of mandates, you're skeptical of the sort of top-down regulations here, but you're not skeptical of electric vehicles per se, 
as perhaps the future of automobile transit in this country. Um, but you're also on my side when it comes to the mandates, right? That's a that's the price yeah. of admission. So look, I think the government has a real interest in regulating external pollutants that, for example, you know, find particularly matter. It really is very bad for us. And we shouldn't, you know, inhale noxious combustion byproducts to own the libs. On the other hand, you know, there's also other things to like about these cars. They accelerate fast. They're zippy. They're actually cheaper. Uh, they should be, um, as the prices come down, cheaper for overall lifetime. Um, they need fewer repairs because there's fewer moving parts. There's a lot to like about these vehicles. But precisely for that reason, the correct way to, to hasten us to that future is not for the government to mandate that people buy these, these vehicles before they're obviously superior to gasoline cars for a lot of uses. And the big obstacle is, look, there's not a charging infrastructure out there yet. You know, they, they have $7.5 billion for charging, which I actually think is a, you know, you can make a legitimate argument that we need to build some infrastructure to let this transition happen. Um, but they, in 2021, and, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, they included $7.5 billion to build, hopefully, 500,000 charging stations. As of December, they had built zero of them, right? So this is really putting the cart before the horse. And if you do that, leaving aside the infringement on personal freedom um, and those sorts of issues, you're actually risking a political backlash. Because if you're forcing people to buy cars and there's nowhere to charge them, they are going to run to their polling station and vote out the politicians who did that, which is actually a setback for the cause of getting people into these cars. Because if they've had that experience, they're going to be very twice shy about trying it again when that infrastructure is there, when the quality and the price is there. Megan, I don't know if, I, if there is an answer to this, but maybe you know. Um, what explain? There was this burst of enthusiasm in the in the marketplace for electric vehicles a couple of years ago, and it has declined. There's probably no one explanation for it, but do you do you have a, a handle on what you think is is leading to this um, yeah. uh, declining enthusiasm among the among there's consumers? A, there's a lot going on here. Number one, there were some subsidies. These these cars are often sold at a loss, not for Tesla, but for other manufacturers. And so subsidies were really doing a lot of work to get people into the cars. Um, that's a piece of it. Another piece of it is that basically everyone who has one of these cars right now, they're in, they're early adopters. They're enthusiasts. They tend to be higher income, which means they can afford the higher sticker shock. And by the way, that's insurance as well as the price of the vehicle is higher, um, because even though they require fewer repairs, when you have to repair them, the repairs right now cost more because the parts are more expensive. Um, so that was a big issue. Another thing is right, these people, they all rush to buy these cars. Well, now they have the cars. They're going to have the cars for quite a while. Um, these are second cars for almost all of them. Almost all of them have a, 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 an internal combustion engine at home for, for example, their longer road trips um, or for if they're the sort of people who want to haul a lot of stuff in deep winter and are worried about, you know, running out the charge on a combination of heavy weight and trying to run the heater. Um, so for all those things, right, this is a second fun car. And as I say, it is a lot of fun. There's a, like people who have Teslas love them. The problem is that it's not ready yet to be most people's primary cars. And even for people like me, like we almost never drive longer than a single charge. We're in many ways the ideal candidate, except that I live in a row house, a street park, and I don't have anywhere to charge the thing. Yeah, that, none of that sounds optimal to me. Jason, um, we hear a lot, and I mean a lot, excessively about Joe Biden's problem with Michigan voters. Democrats want to boil that down to anxiety among the state's Arab American voters over the war in Israel, or war in Gaza, rather. And we hear nothing about anything outside of that uh, construct. And it seems to me that to one degree or another, the auto workers in that state, that which captures roughly 20% of the state's workforce, who are really frustrated with this, might have something to do with that. When they went on strike, when auto workers went on strike last year, they were open, including the unions and rank and file alike, were very open about how frustrated were, they were with the Biden administration's EV mandates. Maybe Michiganders just don't love this assault on their way of life? That's a good point. And it gets to another point, which is, in my view, the folly of making long-term policy like this around a presidential administration only, I mean, without, without Congress, because you can have an election and the next administration can reverse these regulations. Um, and, uh, and that goes back to the problem of the people. The people are the problem, Jason. Well, and uh, I mean, yeah, and, and it goes to, you know, 
you need a consensus for something like this. Um, you know, so even if you have, you know, even if you have a substantial minority or a brief majority of people who are who are, you know, live in a way that is conducive to this regulation, the next administration will reverse it. I mean, you can't you can't make policy that's intended to stretch um, decades um, around only um, you know the pen and the phone of the president because. Mm -hmm. Uh, Americans are more and more polarized about this. And that goes, you know, you can make short-term policies, you can make short-term adjustments, uh, but it's going to throw a wrench in your whole thing, unless you think either that Republicans are going to come around to this plan, or you think Republicans are going to be permanently um, out of office into the 2030s. So um, I can you know. see them convincing themselves of both of those two conditions. Neither of which are likely, but they can probably foresee the the a, a grand future in which Republicans are forced to come around to their way of thinking because it is so enlightened and far sighted, and also that Republicans will never win another election, not a national one. Indeed, well, the Upper Midwest will have its say, and it's inconvenient, as you said, for Democrats that the the swing states in these elections seem to be the the car manufacturing areas of the country. Megan, let's zoom out a little bit. I'm sorry, please. Do you have a thought? Uh, you know, this was actually watered down as a concession to the United Auto Workers. And you have to think that there's at least some chance that the auto workers just think, well, we're going to stretch this out and then it's never going to happen because the Republicans going to get in. That's yeah. I mean, well, so, yeah. So everybody's operating on the assumption that nothing matters today. So, Megan, help me zoom out a little bit. Let's think about this as a as a, just an enterprise, a competitive consumer enterprise. Has, has one ever been incepted? through subsidization maybe i'm missing something but is isn't this project doomed to failure if the dogs just won't eat the dog food um well i think what the what the left would argue is like look we did this with cafe standards we got you know we mandated that they have that the the corporate fleet the GM or Ford sells has to have a certain level of average auto efficiency. But I would say a couple of things about that is that first of all, one reason that SUVs are so common in America is that they had a different regulatory standard for cafe. So, you know, it, it made the cars more fuel efficient, but it pushed a lot of people into light trucks, which had a, a different and lower regulation. And, and, you know, the effects of that are not clear. Similarly, it caused them to subsidize and sell at a loss a lot of small, very fuel efficient cars, which arguably actually put more cars on the road. So it's actually really quite difficult to force these sorts of changes from a top down approach. It's much better to, you know, if you want to to say there's a lot of costs to burning carbon, um, there's a lot of costs to putting this in the atmosphere, you know, do something with a gas tax that's going to actually cause people to say, give them the choice. I think this is true with appliances too, right? If you think that we're underpricing electricity and water, we should price those things more efficiently to account for those negative externalities. We should not be forcing people in rainy DC where we, you know, you cannot throw a rock without sending it into a body of water. Um, I should not be having to have a slow, inefficient dishwasher so that people in Phoenix, Arizona, who have a real water supply problem, um, can be forced to conserve that way. This is not, th these approaches, they breed resentment and they're just not very efficient for, you know, for the amount of intrusion, you do not get a lot of great results. My colleague, Dominic Pino wrote a piece on the dishwasher thing uh, in which he, he noticed that uh, if you were to use this, the dishwasher as it's recommended, given its flow rate, and it doesn't function, it's his experience, it doesn't function as his previous dishwasher does, you end up using more water, and yeah. you spend more time and energy pre-washing the dish. Ultimately, the appliance is less efficient. You have time that you're now investing in this that you didn't previously. All of that's money, and none of it makes any sense. I would also add, I'm looking at some statistics here, it seems like sedans are losing popularity, sedans, smaller calls, cars. And sales is in in uh, in contrast to SUVs and crossovers, which are on the rise, which again suggests that this is just what people want. Uh, My favorite Jay example of this is washing machines, where the top loading washing machines just didn't get the clothes clean with the new <laughs> water standards, and so people were running them two or three times. Yes, which ate yes. back <laughs> and some uh, the whatever the water and efficiency gains had been from from the new designs because it's not efficiency we need a new word to describe this it's not efficiency it's the opposite of efficiency it's just fewer inputs which is very different jason and it's, it's going to depend a lot on we don't we don't know what the technology will look like exactly in 10 years but for now 
you know, as what, what Megan is saying and what people enjoy is gas is very efficient as a way to run cars. It's portable, it's safe, it's um, it starts all the time. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. So making electric cars compete, you know, as, as a product, not just, um, you know, actually compete as a product, you know, may happen, but we, we've overestimated the pace at which the electrification network can be built. And I, I think that people are, you know, yeah, overestimating the pace at which the product can become competitive. So Jason, I want to spark some tension here because um, I'm going to challenge. I don't know how friendly you are to quote unquote industrial policy, but there are many on the right who are increasingly the top down economic planning. I'm not among them, but it's a it's a fashionable point of view on the right these days. And one of their foremost concerns as it relates to the EV market is the prospect that Chinese overcapacity will flood the market with cheap EVs and really suppress domestic industry, or at least put it on the back foot. Their answer to this situation, as far as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, is subsidies. But the communist Chinese will always outbid you when it comes to subsidization. Moreover, uh, George Mason University's uh, Don Bordeaux recently wrote, quote, it's equally true that importing fewer EVs and thus increasing EV production in the U.S. shrinks the proportion of American industrial capacity devoted to producing output other than EVs. In, in other words, it's more money goes to something that we're not quite as efficient at as opposed to something that maybe we are. Is there a strong argument for allowing the market to chase consumer preference that will resolve by itself whatever threat Chinese electric vehicles imports represent? Well, I find the industrial policy debate on the right a little bit tiresome, and I think it's <laughs> kind of semantic and, you know, depending on what your priorities are. But I think, frankly, this is an example yeah, of, you know, if, if you want, you know, the right wants industrial policy for different things, I guess, than the left wants industrial policy for. And the, the problem I raise with people on the right who are fans of this is look at the industrial policy we're getting. It's going to be for, you know, creating... Um, DEI friendly electric car industry. Um, so, you know, I think that the uh, that the subsidies and the industrial policy will happen on EVs. And if it and if there's enough money spent on it, it can work. I mean, it will. Ex I mean, we saw the subsidies work in order to accelerate the adoption of Tesla's. So I don't think that it um, that it won't work if if there was the political will to spend that much money. So Megan, am I am I just a dinosaur here? I'm, am I clinging bitterly to my two-stroke engines and my gasoline-powered appliances and my natural gas furnace and water heater and what have you? Just the the march of progress is going to leave me behind. I mean, look, I think I think there are really are things to like about these products. For example, it would be kind of convenient to have a gas pump in your house, right, where you would just be able to fill up overnight instead of having to drive to the gas station. That's like actually a nice feature. Um, similarly, I think induction ranges, act, induction ranges actually boil water faster and they don't produce, there are some noxious byproducts. It's not great to be breathing in. Um, but those, those, those problems have been wildly exaggerated by people who are mostly really worried about the, the greenhouse gas problem. And the problem with thinking about this kind of mandate as a greenhouse gas solution is that most of the action is not in the United States anymore. You know, United States environmental groups are focused on our conservation in a way that is seems almost fetishistic. Like what they're really interested in is forcing people to just live kind of lower consumption lifestyles. But actually there's the big issue is that there are billions of people out there who have really low carbon lifestyles because they're really poor and they don't consume a lot of stuff. And those people want to be as, as rich and comfortable as we are for very understandable reasons. And we what we need to do is actually invest in making products. You know, I think American industry can do this. I think there's some role for government R&D. Invest in make, and there's certainly a big role for tearing down the siting and permitting barriers that have made it hard to, for example, build electric charging stations. But the real is issue is that all of those people outside of the country who want to consume more energy because energy is what makes for a more comfortable, delightful life. And we need to find a way to do that cleanly and not incinerate the planet. But the way to do that is not by grabbing your, you know, gas blown, ga gas powered leaf blower from your, 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 you know, screwed up, angry, white knuckled hands. It is to actually <laughs> make a great electric leaf blower so that eventually you're like, well, I'm kind of cranky about this. 
But, you know, I got to admit, this is a great leaf blower and I want to own it. And, you know, we should not be doing things that make people crankier and make people think, oh, here's an inferior product that the government has to force on you because people are not going to put up with that. The answer to all our problems is cold fusion and harvesting helium-3 from the surface of the moon. One I'm day, one day we'll get around to it. Um, turn our attention briefly to the Supreme Court, which this week heard oral arguments in the case challenging the FDA's regulatory structure around the drug mifeprestone, which is marketed as mifeprex, and this is commonly used in a two-drug regimen that facilitates pharmaceutical abortions. The Fifth Circuit found that the FDA had restructured this, the regulations around this drug poorly, ordered it to back off, um, but the Supreme Court does not seem to be inclined to share the uh, Fifth Circuit's rationale. The conservatives on the court, save uh, Justice Thomas's and Alito, seemed to look askance at the arguments that were being made um, by Senator Josh Hawley's wife, who is representing the plaintiffs in this case. Uh, Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch uh, kind of adopted his libertarian style and worried that the court would be turning itself into a super legislature if it sided with the lower court. Uh, Roberts and Kavanaugh alike seemed to question the suggested remedy uh, to the harm that these drugs cause, said that it can be narrower than what they're seeking. And Amy Coney Barrett just seemed skeptical that the plaintiffs had standing whatsoever. Um, Jason, if the Supreme Court passes on this, the left has to be very conflicted about it. Ahead of this case, there was a full court press in media outlets to prep the beaches for this as Dobbs part two. It was called the daughter of Dobbs in one NPR article I read on this case. Um, and it's not as though this drug causes no harm. Some women do experience very severe complications. Uh, and the American Medical uh, Association Journal, JAMA, said that uh, there had been an approximately an, uh, a significant increase, 20, 27,000 online orders of abortion pills between July and December 2022, um, which is a significant increase from previous years. Apparently, the pandemic is pushing this. So do we think the plaintiffs overreached here, or are we reading too much into oral arguments, given the scale and the scope of what really does seem to be a problem? Well, I make two points zooming out. The first is the same as the EPA, the point about the EPA and imposing a solution through the EPA. Now we're talking about the FDA and we're talking about a democratic administration controlling the FDA. And you know, mm. it, the, the, the regulations around the availability of abortion drugs will be changed under a Republican FDA. So all this is very temporary and just underscores the problem of trying to do policy on an administrative basis without legislation. Um, the other big picture thing is, you know, the Supreme Court tried to take itself out of the abortion uh, regulation business by uh, reversing its decision in Roe versus Wade. So it's reverted to the Democratic branches of, of government, including in this case, the executive branch with, with the president acting through the FDA. And they're losing terribly. I mean, conservatives, you know, when you lose referenda in Ohio and Kansas, um, you're losing. When um, the number of abortions is the highest that it's been in 10 years, um, according to a recent article in America Magazine. Um, gut macro I saw that, Jason. I yeah. saw that statistic, but I didn't read that piece. Did, did you read uh, if, if there was a geographic association? Yeah, no. So it's increased. I mean, you know, about 14 states have restricted abortion significantly, you know, a, ha a handful outright bans. But basically, it's increasing in the adjacent states. And also, the, this male, the mifepristone, um, it's going through the mail. Um, and uh, so, you know, it just has, there, there's been more abortions. Um, and yeah, geographically, it's concentrated around, in, in states where it's banned, there's been an increase in, in the adjacent states. So that's part of what's happened. And, and the, the chemical abortion is part of what's happened, as, as we're seeing with this drug. So that's not been effective. Meanwhile, support for abortion is a lot higher, higher than its um, support for, um, you know, than it has been, I think, also in about 10 years or, you know, a, a significant uptick since then. So basically, the democratic process is kind of rendering its verdict, I would say, and it is, you know, not the one that, that conservatives would have hoped for. And I think, you know, the Supreme Court is not going to restrict access to Mifepristone. I think, you're right. I think the standing um, aspect of it is is the cleanest way to resolve this, to just say, listen, you're doctors, you object to this policy, but 
it's really tenuous to say that you have a case or controversy or a standing before the court. And, and I would add, you know, as you see, I'm interested in the process by which these, these rules get made. That's a good thing to make a limited uh, role for the courts in sort of um, just, you know, the founders did not intend for the Supreme Court to review laws before they became a law. They're, the law was supposed to go into effect. It was supposed to harm somebody. Then there was supposed to be a case. And then you could have standing. If it's just a regulation comes out, a lower court judge blocks it across the country, the Supreme Court decides whether it's okay. That's not an ideal way to do policy. And that's what's uh, going to prevail here, I think. Yeah, but there is nothing less satisfying than having a case dismissed on standing. Precisely, nobody nobody gets the, gets the narrative they're looking for when it's a decision on standing. Uh, mm -hmm. Megan, so I, I can see the pro-life argument here, which is very clearly defined. Um, and a lot of my colleagues share the the rationale that the plaintiffs uh, ha have when they brought the suit, but I can't think of anything more politically damaging than the logic that was articulated by Justices Thomas and Alito, who I who I certainly admire as justices and as thoughtful intellectuals, legal scholars. But they cited um, the work of, uh, well, rather the law, actually, that is derived from the work of anti-vice campaigner Anthony Comstock. Uh, and whatever Comstock laws remain on the books from the 1870s. Now, one of the, some of those laws that were designed to prohibit the transmission of lewd and lascivious literature uh, and during the Gilded Age, and because uh, these, some of these laws are still on the books, at least they, they prohibit uh, the ability to transmit abortion drugs over, um, over the post, and there are a lot of states that appeal to them to limit access to these drugs that it's it's perfectly viable and constitutional i can't think of a worse narrative for republicans at this particular moment to be leaning into comstockery to justify the prohibition of abortifacients maybe i'm overreading this thing but that seems like a terrible political narrative it seems crazy to me and i actually <laughs> This speaks more broadly to the real problem that that pro-lifers have, which is that you know they actually did a good job at their primary goal, which was getting Roe struck down. Struck down because without getting Roe struck down, nothing else that they did really mattered very much. They could make changes on the margin, but they couldn't make big changes. Um, and I think the problem of that is that on both sides for 50 years, everything revolved around the courts. Everything was focused around getting justices on your side. And a lot of really bad law drafting happened under that protective umbrella, right? If you're a pro-life activist and you want to get a rape, tri a rape trigger law, or sorry, an abortion trigger law in the books. Um, you have, you know, you go to um, your legislators and they're just like, yeah, I will give you whatever you say. No rape exception, no incest exception, no life of the mother exception, um, because this law is never going to take effect. So why do I care what it says? All I care is that the abortion activists feel like I have signaled that I love them and that I am with them on the fundamental sanctity of human life. And to be clear, I don't think that's a, a crazy or absurd view, but it is not a politically popular view. And ultimately in a democratic society, you have to come up with laws that can pass muster with, with a something close to a, mo a voting majority of the public. And they did not do that. And these laws took effect and they created hideous publicity for them and for their movement. Um, they created all the, you know, the, the hideous story of the 10 year old girl in Ohio who was raped, who went to Indiana to get an abortion because of, uh, because of, Ohio's trigger law, um, you know, the the women who are having difficulty accessing treatment for difficult pregnancies that had gotten into, you know, the, for miscarriages and so forth. These are horrific stories that they were completely unprepared for. With the movement now, and I think you are, that is part of, not all of what is going on with the referenda that you see the, the pro-life movement losing referendum after referendum. I also think, honestly, that under the shield of Roe, of Ro, a lot of people felt free to be like, well, abortion's wrong. But when it push came to shove, they didn't want that option taken away. So the pro-life movement does not need to be going back to the courts. It does not need to be going through the administrative state. What it needs to be doing is winning hearts and minds, is figuring out what are the politically acceptable compromises, where can we push forward, where can we not right now until we have actually changed people's minds on this issue? What can we do? What sorts of ancillary things can we do like bil building more and better crisis pregnancy centers, supporting new mothers to make abortion a less attractive choice, um, to, which is 
in the long run going to help people persuade, going to help you persuade more people to be um, against abortion. They need to do that work. They need to not bring lawsuits. They need to not be trying to to work the refs. What they need to do is a really hard work of political change. And I'm afraid that the movement is does not seem right now primed to do that work. And instead, they're they're talking in these really counterproductive ways. Before we get to a little bit more ref working, um, viewers, if you have questions for me or my guests, please feel free to submit them. You can go down to your reactions tab and raise your hand or just write them in the comments and I will uh, take a look at them and field them and see if anybody has uh, has a response. But Jason, back to Megan's point about bringing lawsuits rather than persuading. Um, the So the role that Dobbs played in 2022 breaking the red wave, I think, can be really easily overstated. It's complicated by the governors who won re-election after having pursued rather restrictive um, social covenants around abortion at the state level. But it is very hard to find polling that shows even Republicans are behind, for example, the uh, the new status quo that has emerged following the Alabama Supreme Court decision, which found that embryos, fertilized embryos, are functionally children. And the outgrowth of that was to force uh, in vitro fertilization providers to restrict access to their services. Now, Democrats um, nationally have been trying to connect this with Dobbs, connect this with um, with this uh, uh, the abortion drug case, and just broadly make this about reproductive health and the Republican Party's assault on it, what have you. Uh, it's all different. Chemical abortifacients are different from IFV, which is different from abortion broadly. But you still have to do a lot of explaining in order to convey that point. And Republicans have this natural instinct that to run away from the decision in the Alabama Supreme Court case. And there is some data to suggest from Republican committees that candidates who support a family's ability to access these services are preferred over candidates who do not by the voting base. And, you know, the, the old adage maintains if you're explaining, you're losing. And Republicans have a lot of explaining to do here, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're straight off losing in Kansas and Ohio you know, red states, basically, referenda on availability of abortion, you know, sometime in the second trimester. And then you're starting to argue about, you know, IVF. And, um, you know, that, that just tells you how marginal uh, that view is. I mean, the fact that Alabama's legislature, you know, overturned this, you know, you can debate, you know, what exactly the, the regulation should say, but that they tried to reverse the effect of it so quickly um, in you know, Alabama shows you um, where the politics are in this. And I do think, you know, I do think Republicans have a problem here. I'm going to be, be honest because I think, you know, so they're all saying, no, we support, we support IVF. Um, we want there to be access to IVF. Katie Britt, you know, the Senator from Alabama who gave the um, response to the state of the union is saying this Senate leaders are saying this and so on, but that's, you know, if you were to push them on this, and with the if if you really take the the point of view that every um, fertilized egg embryo uh, that at that point is a is an embryo deserves you know the full protections of a human being, it's going to be really hard for you to actually support IVF, which which involves the non-use or and and discarding of some embryos. So it's you know so so Republicans. You know the the Democrats are going to attack them for trying to have it both ways, and I think that you know there's there is something to that. If you if you put a Republican pro life person in the hot seat, I mean Mike Johnson has has sponsored the Life at Conception Act, uh, uh, and he's also made his uh, done his best to distance his party from this ruling. It's going to be tough for them. So there's going to need to be you know they're going to get you know really raked over the coals on this. I I I think um, and. So, you know, yeah, so the, uh, you put your finger on it. And Megan, this was actually news to me because I'm sort of on the fringes of the pro-life movement, although my institution that I work for, National Review, is very pro-life. But I was not aware of the extent to which there's a lot of hostility towards the fertility industry for precisely those reasons, because you're fertilizing embryos and, and discarding them. Um, and they don't take kindly to that. However, the the ideolo ideological politics of this sort of break down weirdly. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s running mate is apparently extremely hostile to the fertility industry and IVF in particular. Now, her reasons are kind of kooky, 
um, as the entire uh, ticket is. But this goes back to something I was talking with my guests last week, is that the RFK's vote right now, such as it is, seems to be from the polling to be a protest vote that really hurts Joe Biden more than it hurts Donald Trump. But everywhere I go, I see evidence that the RFK vote is attracting and appealing to the kind of marginal voter, low propensity voter, dissatisfied voter who would lean against an incumbent or an anti-establishmentarian candidate like Donald Trump and attract those voters and maybe turn them out if they turn out at all. And this is one of those weird ones where if you're like, if you're extremely pro-life and this is your issue, there's probably 13 people in America who would say IVF is my issue. But if that's your issue, you're not going to get that from Donald Trump. You'll get it from RFK. I was reading this New York Times um, focus group, an extremely vexing thing. Those focus groups are very frustrating, but I do it as penance. And, you know, a lot of them were talking about how RFK is just, is the, he's the rule breaker. He's going to flip the tables and tear down the columns and really do what they wanted Donald Trump to have done in 20 between 2017 and 2021. I, I don't suspect RFK captures the pro-life vote, but does he attract it on the margins? Does he attract the kook vote on the margins? And does the Biden campaign have to spend money to make that happen? I think this is one of the most interesting questions in this election right now. Um, I think that he does clearly attract the kook vote, but which kooks? Um, <laughs> and one thing that we don't know yet is that the the, the campaigns, I think, are going to have to spend money. If he's in and makes a serious run, they are going to have to spend money. And what they're going to have to try to spend money doing is driving their opponents' voters towards RFK while keeping their own. And how that's all going to cash out. I mean, and you have seen, by the way, you know, especially on the Democratic side, the Republicans have not been as good at this, is, you know, you've seen this pattern of candidates trying to, to affect primary voters by running things, for example, that this man is too Trumpy for our district, which is obviously <laughs> designed to drive Trump voters to this person, the Republican Party, uh, Republican primary. It has unfortunately actually been a, it was a pretty effective strategy in 2022, much to my sorrow. And I think that you might see something like that again, where you've got Democrats running, RFK is just Donald Trump, but more so, right? And, 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 how and whether the Republicans can come up with a counter strategy to that that drives some Biden voters towards RFK. I think this that might be certainly I mean, one they of would the be lulled into a they'd be lulled into a false sense of security, right? The Republicans, just by virtue of his name recognition, he's capturing so many Democratic votes as it is. Why throw money yeah, at it? I Especially if your resources they, I, are, are finite. I think they might, but my understanding is that the people running Trump's campaign are actually more strategic and smart than they were in twenty in twenty sixteen. So I think they are hope. I mean, I don't know if I want to say hopefully he's not my candidate, but if I were them, I would certainly be thinking about how do I get more Biden voters to, to vote for for RFK? How do I move those people out of the Biden column and into the kook and into the kook central? Central. All right. So turning from um, that very weighty issue to something far less important, and I mean, very unimportant to the degree that we got, we got it rose to the level of mobile push alerts from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And I was shocked to see that there must have been nothing going on yesterday. But the news shocked the media world yesterday that RNC chair, former RNC chair, Rona Romney McDaniel, who was very briefly an NBC News contributor, uh, lost the role that she held for, I guess, all of 48 hours. And it came following an absolute meltdown on the part of uh, NBC and MSNBC on-air talent who uh, went on just about every hour to deliver a diatribe attacking uh, both uh, McDaniel and their network, their employer, for having the temerity to hire her. Um, full disclosure, I used to be an NBC News MSNBC contributor for about three years. I still like every, a lot of people over there. I have good relationships over there, and I very much uh, cherish my time on air. I thought it was a very valuable, uh, a very valuable enterprise, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. But that said, I have absolutely no idea what happened here, and it is absolutely humiliating to watch the spectacle. I kind of, and I also predicted on um, the National Review podcast that. Uh, McDaniel would survive mere hours before she was ousted, in part because we've seen this before. 
This is precisely what they did to Mick Mulvaney when he was tapped by CBS News to be a contributor. He's been fine as a contributor, kind of milk toast, in fact, and largely in pursuit of something on something like a redemption tour, uh, no longer towing the party line, saying what he thinks. And sometimes what he thinks cuts against Donald Trump. And networks love that. And what was Ronna McDaniel doing? She was on the redemption tour. She was saying, you know, maybe this Jan th 6 thing is pretty bad, right? And we probably shouldn't pardon everybody who was convicted of rioting in that, right? So I thought they might just keep her around for penance. Nope, scuttled, thrown right out. Um, Megan, what do you make of this obviously pretextual rationale that NBC News couldn't bestow its imprimatur on her because she was advancing untruths in her in her career as an RNC uh, advocate? Um, and the notion here is that shouldn't extend to anybody in the world of politics who who spins or weaves untruths to the advantage of the principal, their the their boss, whoever's in elected office. That just doesn't fly. It's clearly not an actual principle that's being applied elsewhere on the network or on any network. So this is just obviously an effort to extirpate Trump officials, anybody who served in the Trump White House, from public life. Just get rid of them. Yeah, I think that this is a mistake on multiple levels. First of all, if you're going to hire someone, you know this is going to happen, right? Like you you are not, if you are, I hope, if you're an NBC executive in this day and age, you are not surprised that some of your more liberal employees are going to be upset about this. And if you are not prepared to weather the storm, you shouldn't make the hire in the first place. So that just speaks to a management problem. Um, I think that the second and bigger issue, though, is the conception, you know, this whole idea, we can't, we cannot bestow our sacred imprimatur uh, on someone who participated or someone who excused January 6th. She did not participate in January 6th. <laughs> right. Yes, um, but you're not and, making that up. Sacred airwaves was the term that was right. used by sacred, Nicole sacred Wallace. Airwaves. Right. And I think that this is crazy in part because like it assumes something that by the very action you are taking, you do not have. So let me explain what I mean by that. What people inside are thinking is we have all this influence over the public. They view us as arbiters of right and wrong, of what is true and what is untrue. And we cannot have someone speaking for us who has done something so obviously and clearly morally reprehensible. Well, guys, half the country looks like they're voting for this guy. I disagree with them. I think he is bad. I think he should have been impeached and removed from office and barred from running again after January 6th. They're still there. I share a country with them. They are my fellow Americans. You cannot have influence over those Americans if you have anathematized their views. You can have one or the other. Either you can attempt to be a broadly representative in institution that represents the full views of the majority of the American public and anathematizes only things we really all agree on, like child molesters should not be on my <laughs> network, or you can be someone who represents the views of 50% of the people, and you will be very influential within that 50%, but you are not going to influence the rest. And what they are assuming is that they can somehow do this anathematization of someone who, again, nearly half the country voted for in 2020, like who is currently up in the polls, although I think that's shifting a little bit. Um, you can't do that while declaring that their views are so outside the pale that you won't even talk to people like that. And I think that the choice that they're making is actually the wrong one. I think we need more broad institutions. I think what Trump did on January 6th is reprehensible, but a lot of my fellow Americans disagree with me, and I need to talk to people who understand why they disagree. Yeah, Jason, I don't think anybody would accuse MSNBC, I certainly wouldn't, of not being ideologically invested in outcomes, in election outcomes. And that's just part of the brand. And it's the same across the spectrum of cable news for the most part. Um, but when they tell themselves that, well, we can't put Rona McDaniel on the air or else we'll contribute to the declining trust in media. You know, they're kidding themselves. Declining trust in media is an outgrowth of the fact that we all recognize that we are being privy to an ideological project. And in fact, we're being drafted into that project uh, in, in, if we actually submit to watching cable news, which is an ever declining prospect for a lot of Americans. But it has nothing to do with their credibility as a news organization in fact is probably the opposite the credibility of the news organization was was damaged by this episode no well no it's an honor to be on your sacred sacred <laughs> be, be worthy 
of that sanctity uh, that, that we're experiencing right now. I bless now. you. I bless yeah. you, my son. Thank you. Um, no, look, I mean, what what really I can't stand is just the cowardice of of you know the managers of these places who who run the you know you're a corporate manager you run the place and then you get yelled at on Twitter and you get yelled at in your company channels and you just buckle just so predictably I mean I guess you you predicted on the podcast that she would last but we we should have predicted she wouldn't last because this is just the oh everybody else did I was the only one who was extremely wrong though my rationale was perfectly defensible I would say just very very wrong yeah, don't don't bet on the courage of media executives. Um, you know, their their priority is being respectable, you know, within within among their employees and among their social circles. And you can count on them to buckle in general. And it's you know, this was a really terrible example of that. And um, uh, so, you know, and, you know, Jack Schaefer had this article about the power now that employees wield. I mean, that's extraordinary. You know, yeah. I would never criticize my bosses on the air. Um, I would never, you know, criticize my own bosses publicly, but now that's just, that's just normalized. I mean, the way that the balance of power has shifted toward employees and they know that they can uh, compel their bosses to do things um, is really changing, is really changing media. Yeah. I don't think anybody at 30 Rock was surprised by a Slack channel revolt. You should come to expect that. I think they were surprised by the entirety of the on-air talent from the, the day side to prime time, hour after hour, hammering the brass over this one. Um, but Jason, briefly to your point on courage, uh, that goes for Republican politicians and people in the business of politics too. There's sort of this nascent talk of, well, this is going to really hamper NBC's ability to access Republican politics now because we're just gonna we're gonna close off access to NBC and I don't see that happening either now my prediction record being what it is take it with a grain of salt but if we're talking about courage here then it would require a lot of politicians to say no I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm gonna forego that camera time which just doesn't seem like something I would bet my mortgage on right and and you know Rana McDaniel is probably not the hill, you know, the the, the cause for which they're going to sacrifice um, so much. So so I kind of doubt that. I think that um, the things will go on as usual. I mean, Donald Trump himself claims to hate uh, these media outlets and loves the attention uh, from them. So and and you know does not talk, stop him from from uh, talking to to reporters and so on whom he claims to despise. So I think that's kind of an act. Yeah, I tend to agree. Megan, you already touched on this briefly, but do you recall in the wake of Donald Trump's 2016 victory, there was a, a full on full court press in just about every corner of the news media, uh, print and cable and uh, broadcast alike, all of them saying, well, but we totally missed this. No idea how this happened. We have to really commit ourselves to correcting course. And that's when they started parachuting in reporters into diners in West Virginia and Ohio to try to take the temperature of the room and get the feel of the Trump voter. And then that's when MSNBC, for example, among others, started hiring people like me and Brett Stevens and try to say, maybe we can talk to somebody who has some conservative views. Uh, there was a lot of efforts to do some outreach there. And then it just kind of melted away, particularly as the prospect of a, a post-Trump moment became less and less of a, of a likelihood. It just seemed less less like there was a necessity to try to fully understand this movement and more of a necessity to destroy it and just throttle it in the cradle. Uh, but they're doing the same things that they did to themselves in 2015, 2016. No, just sort of closing their eyes and hoping it'll go away. Yeah, I think this is really dangerous, right? You can, you can, you can't. One thing that just shocks me is the number of people who still seem to think that you can somehow make Trump go away by deplatforming him. Um, and, you know, honestly, I would argue that deplatforming has been good for Trump. Why is Trump up in the polls right now? He's up in the polls because we're not hearing that much of, uh, from him because his lawyers have made him shut up. Well, and, but that is changing, you know, though. That is changing. Is, I think that is changing. And I think that might be one reason that Biden does seem to be improving right now. And so I think that this whole idea that we had the power to change this. And there was this moment, as you say, right after 2016, when people were in shock and they said, wow, maybe I should figure out what I got wrong. But that ran up against internal incentives to, you know, to 
wield your instant there's a, something called the iron law of institutions where people care more about their power within the institution than they do about their effectiveness outside of it and i think that's ultimately what we saw okay interrogating what we got wrong it doesn't feel good it's really unpleasant i in fact wrote a whole book about failure and this is one of the most common things is that if people can find a way to confront the fact that they personally made a mistake they will they will find that way and the way that they found in in within media institutions was, was often to be like, well, we know what happened. He's a racist. And so are, I guess, 50 percent of Americans. And now we don't need to ask anything else. What we have discovered is that he's a bad person and they're all bad people. And now we know the answer and we don't need to learn more. What we need to do is somehow, as you say, destroy the bad people. And the crazy thing about that was that obviously we did not have the power to destroy the bad people. We are still going to be sharing a country with them. So you had better figure out what it is that they want. Um, and instead, we devolved into these stupid, endless fights over whether racism explained all or merely most <laughs> of the votes for Trump. And the, the weird thing about this, right, was like the triumph of someone who felt like they had proven that, Don, that, that all Trump voters were racist. And I was like, what do you think you won? If you're right, you're sharing the country with people who are irredeemably racist and are going to vote like irredeemable racists for decades hence. Why are you happy about that news? Why does this thrill you? I don't think this is, by the way, the correct account. I'm not saying that no Trump voters are racist. I think some of them are. Um, but I don't think that that's the entire or even most of the story here. And I was shocked at the number of people who seemed to think that like they got a big prize if they proved that all of these people just hate people who aren't white. And I was like, that is terrible news. That should make you cry when you, if you feel like you've actually, that's what you've actually discovered. And it was this, it was just a personal quest to feel like I'm superior, to lock myself into a bubble, to not have to have any information other than those people are bad and I don't need to know anything more about them. And they succeeded, but there was a really high price. And I, I watch people now trying to replicate that behavior and I am deeply concerned. <laughs> You raised so many things that I had tried to suppress about the early Trump years and the prospect, the inescapable, inescapable prospect of what you're describing would be uh, in the, the following a Trump restoration, just uh, the incentives to blame America and blame the system and blame the voters and lash out um, will be pretty difficult to avoid. Uh, and it will be very discouraging and perhaps destructive. Jason, briefly back to Ronna McDaniel, who's the person we're talking about here, uh, oddly enough, because uh, apparently the network really did court her for some time. Lord knows why. She's not especially well connected to Trump world from everything we know. She's she was an extremely ineffective RNC chair. I mean, I don't I'm I'm sure that there are a lot of people who will defend her. But she held her job through inertia alone. She presided in 2018 over the loss of the House, in 2020 over the loss of the presidency, in 2021 over the loss of the Senate, and in 2022 they blew headwinds, historic headwinds that will never materialize again, only through inertia and, by the way, the GOP's utter allergy to any studious retrospective on Trump's electoral record. Did she maintain her job? Why was she the person that they decided to get in the first place? And maybe they just came to their senses and realized, wow, we stuck our necks out for somebody who really doesn't bring anything to the table. No, they didn't come to their senses. I mean, they 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 got scared because they were being um, called mean things by their employees. I think, you know, it, the much more uh, the deliberative process that they apparently went through reflects that they they thought I mean, maybe they thought that it would be a nice narrative to show a pennant uh, Ronna McDaniel. And that that would be kind of that's like what I story. thought. That's exactly what I thought is that right. she, her value was to uh, seek, you know, some sort of forgiveness from the from, the, you know, a supplication to to the victors here in the ideological struggle. Right. I mean, everyone. Yeah. I mean, so so maybe maybe that was maybe that was it. You know, there's no Republican Party. I mean, Trump has taken over the Republican Party in this case, literally, you know, putting his family in charge of the RNC. I mean, we're in an age of weakening parties so they're kind of less relevant and being the chairman uh of a party doesn't doesn't mean what it used to so i think your hypothesis is the best one that i've heard um unless they thought that she was particularly good on air which did, doesn't seem to you know jump off the screen to me but you know 
it doesn't matter to me because to me, what, what matters here is you did it and then you, you know, cut and ran and left somebody hanging out to dry like you always do in the face of criticism that that's just so tiresome. You don't have to hire anyone. You're, you're deciding not to hire people all the time. But but once you do it, I mean, it, you're, it's just this combination of self-regard and cowardice, right. you know, that that uh, that is not a model for, uh, you know, the American people. Yeah, both of you have made that point. And it's an astute point that a sign of uh, an unearned confidence in your own ability to shape the course of events, which is a, which is a corruption for a, a media figure to believe that and to engage in that, to suggest that rather than chronicle events, you can uh, materially alter the trajectory of the revolution. Um, we'll lead you down a lot of terrible paths, but, uh, you know, brief closing thoughts, media environment over the course of the next uh, six months we have until the, the voting starts, I suppose, and maybe a few more months before the election. How bad is it going to get? Are we going to be privy to more of these events as just the media outlets silo themselves off and appeal only to a particular uh, voter, as it were, uh, rather than viewer? Uh, or or maybe this is a wake up call because it looks so embarrassing and everybody in it looks so embarrassing. I'm sure that's not your answer. It's not my answer. But how much worse is it going to get? I think there's going to be pressure. You are certainly going to see employees attempt to repeat this stunt, right? Every time someone gives in, it makes employees at every media organization think, well, maybe I could do that. And so I think there is definitely going to be pressure. Um, I also think that that pressure is going to be enhanced by two things. One, as we know, most of the mainstream media leans left. Most of the non-mainstream media leans very right. Um, and both sides of that right now are worried that they're losing. And that is going to up the emotional stakes here very high. And then a third thing that's happening right now um, is that the media environment, the business of media is terrible. We have seen closure after closure, layoffs um, at multiple outlets, basically since the beginning of the year. I think this is the worst year for the media I have ever seen, worse even than the kind of two, the post-financial crisis consolidation. And of course, that is going to put everyone into a high fervor, both desperation to keep their jobs and a kind of generalized anxiety about the world. I think all of those things are going to feed into um, a... a a, a situation that will be interesting to watch from the outside, but not a whole lot of fun to live through from the inside. Yeah, I share that. I share that outlook. And I think that is going to put a period on our conversation today. I want to thank you both for joining me. You have been watching Issues with Noah Rothman on Two Way. You can find me at nationalreview.com or on Twitter X at Noah C. Rothman. I really appreciate both my guests being here today. Jason Willick, you can find him at J.A. Willick and Megan McArdle at Asymmetric Info. You can read them both at The Washington Post, and you should. You know I do. And thanks to all of you for watching. We'll see you next week.